Okay, so good morning everyone. Welcome to our uh, seminar, Center for Theoretical and Computational Physics. So it's my great pleasure today to welcome our speaker, who is Professor Samuel Sanchez at the Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia. So Samuel Sanchez is um, researching in this actively developing field of active matter. He's a chemist. He did his PhD in Barcelona. Then after several postdocs, he established or started building his independent group sponsored by ERC starting around at Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Germany. After that, he got a full professorship at the Institute of Bioengineering in Catalonia, where he moved in, uh, in 2016, I think. And now he's a full professor. And recently he was awarded ERC grant by consolidator one uh, on the field of collective properties of this active nano uh, materials and today he will speak to us about his recent result in this field so uh, before i hand the word to samuel i would like to warn you that the seminar will be recorded so please mute yourself and switch off camera and by being online, you agree to be in recorded. So please, Samuel, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mingo, for the kind introduction and also for, for inviting me to, to give this seminar. It has been a long time since I, uh, I received your invitation. We kept postponing because of, of busy schedule, but I'm, I'm very happy um, to, to give the seminar today. Uh, I was then today before. I, a pity I cannot be there. Uh, in, in person, but hope to see you uh, soon. So um, today I'm, I'm gonna talk about how can we make tiny machines that move uh, out of the equilibrium. So we call that self-propel. Um, in our case, chemically power or chemically propel because they will move based on a chemical reaction. And also like for the last, over the last years we, we have try to work at single particle level. So understanding how to control the motion, how do they move, why do they move? And then now very recently we have moved to more collective also from behavior. And as Nico said, this is part of my ERC consolidator that I just started this year. So the video you are seeing here now uh, uh, on this slide is are um, millions of nanoparticles that are self-propelled, uh, swarming, like moving collectively. So this is, a, let's say, a chaotic move, movement. There is no organized, there's no way to direct them, but this is just the first attempt to see under the optical microscope, how can million of these particles move in, in 3D actually. Um, and in particular case, these are nanoparticles of 300 nanometers. So this is very exciting. I will tell you about this, this particular topic at the end of my talk, which just uh, got published yesterday in, in the journal Science Robotics. So, um, before that, I, I want to start with the motivation. So the question here is if we see swarms uh, of like fish, um, flock of birds, they move collectively. So the idea is how can we engineer swimmers at the nanoscale and provide them with this collective intelligence. So we want them to move from one point to another, not at the individual, but many, many together and use them in our particular case over the last a few years since I moved to, to Barcelona, the main focus will be nanomedicine. So the main uh, question here is like, how can we mimic biology? So I, I like to start with this video in, in my, my recent talks, uh, like teasing you a little bit and, and sending you here a question for you to think about. So you're seeing two videos, right? Uh, two videos of things moving, of swimmers. One is biological. So one is a bacterium, and the other one is an artificial self-propelled uh, nanoparticle. So yeah, I think for a while, I will leave some pause here. Which one you think is real, and which one you think actually is just coming here, which one you think is uh, artificial? So. At least I, I, I brought some hesitations on doubts to you because most of the times when we are in person, people doubt like whether the ones on the left are bacteria, the ones on the right are bacteria. So here I can tell you that they, at least if I could make you hesitate, I'm happy enough. So on the right side, 
This paper is um, actually a nanotube which is moved by urea and urease reaction. And this is totally artificial. So this is now in the Guinness World Record just for fun. Well, this is a 200 nanometer in diameter, two micron in length, so similar to a bacteria. And this is from a paper I took from the literature bacteria moving near surfaces. So uh, I'm happy to, to say that, that at least what we are doing resemble uh, active matter or biological swimmers. And, and this, is, this is one of the goals here. So another goal is, as I said, like trans changing from passive transport to active transport. So if we are thinking on a real application, so the other motivation was more about how can we engineer something that moves, right? Out of the claim here, can we do anything with this? So if we want to transport, let's say in the future medicine to a particular location, this is on the right side, the passive uh, transport is not very efficient, but I hope you agree that if you have um, a ship that moves from A to B in a directed matter and self propelled matter will be much more efficient. And if you can pack your cargo inside will be ideal, right? So this is what I wanna, I'm gonna show in the second part of, of our talk. Okay? How can we use this transport uh, for something? But swimming at the nanoscale is very challenging as many of you may know. I mean, this is the only equation, I'm sorry, because I know this is a, a theoretical and physicist at the department, but this is the only equation I'm gonna put today in my talk. Uh, like this is the Reynolds numbers by, by Purcell, so inertia and viscosity. So when you go down in size, as you know, like uh, Reynolds numbers become very small. And this is very challenging for a huge challenge for them, for the swimmers to, to outperform, right, out swim. Uh, this viscosity, and as Porcel said, this is like for them swimming in a pool full of honey. So how did the micro swimmers achieve to move at that small scale? So we want to learn from them, from these um, biological swimmers. And the way they, many of them do it is by converting the chemistry, which is around them, into motion. Okay, so this concept by using catalysis is what uh, has been done over the almost now 20 years since White Sides uh, published the first epidemic plate where he coated or they coated with platinum, they put in hydrogen peroxide solutions and they observe bubbles and these big plates, a centimeter scale, right, they can move collectively and they can assemble with each other. Uh, the micro nanomotors probably one, one referred, can refer to a Usman and Maluk where they started with the gold platinum nanowires where they, if these nanowires can move by uh, a chemical reaction happening on the on the back, moving electrons on the inside, you might have seen also many of the Janus particles based on platinum silica, microtubular jets, and then a more organic stomatocytes by Hess and Wilson, and also you can uh, see very small Janus nanoparticles used by us and, and Fisher sometimes. So there's a plethora of different structures that have been used in in chemically powered nano swimmers or nanomotors. And today I'm gonna show you a couple of systems. So this system over here, these microtubular jets, this is some we started in Dresden from like in the Smith uh, Institute and the other one will be the Janus part, okay? So the system number one will be catalytic particles using platinum as catalyst. And this is something we started with my EC starting grant 2013. We have a few papers over there, and this is one of the uh, of these nano rockets. The one can say it's a tube where the platinum was in the inside. Then you put into a hydrogen peroxide solution. It will generate bubbles, and these bubbles generate a thrust that move the the tube forward. And this is one of these single uh, single particle uh, level, right? So in all the, some of these papers, we managed to have magnetic control, transport cargo, move in microfluidics, and clean water for environmental application, drinking into tissue, many different applications. But once we try to move to a collective behavior, we saw, I mean, we published this in 2013, so I could not find, I could not download the, the, the videos, maybe you, you can in your computer. This is this is very fascinating uh, pack of, of this self-assembly structure collectively. But the problem here is that it will generate so many bubbles that this will break up the, the system. So standing the collective behavior of these bubble propelled particles was extremely challenging and we couldn't go any any farther. So in parallel, we, we moved to 
to Janus particles. Janus, I mean, the video is not, it's not as uh, appealing like the other one, right? But we don't see the bubble, we don't see a thrust, but the chemical principle is the same. So you have the, the Janus structure, like the goth Janus of the two phases, you will see a phase, the black phase contains platinum where the chemical reaction happens. So again, decompose peroxide into oxygen and water. And then you generate a chemical gradient can, uh, that, that generates a slip here um, uh, at, the, at the wall and the surface that moves the fluid uh, backwards, moving the, the particle forward. And, and the mechanism, and Miko knows about that, the mechanism has been claimed in a different way, right? And from 2005 and seven, we're talking about uh, neutral diffusive forces, ionic diffusive forces, self electrokinetic. They have been uh, several mechanisms pro propel, uh, uh, proposed here. And today I'm not going to enter into the mechanism. I'm going to enter about the motion and then the collective control of these particles. Okay. So, because as you see, because the, the fact that we don't see the bubbles that because the oxygen is diffusing, it allows us to see clearly uh, and control this system very, very nicely. So the first thing we, we did is to put these particles near a surface. Actually, this is how we observe under the microscope. So this was not very, um, very surprising, right? But we needed to study what happens once the particles near a surface. So that was a, a paper actually we had uh, together with Michael, Nico, and, and Will. And that was work done by Giuliani and Jadid. Actually, this first part of my talk will be basically the uh, PZ physics from, from JV. Um, so in this world we study, we make microfabricated structures, so very thin, very shallow uh, structure, and we put the particles on the top, and we saw how these particles can be actually interacting with the walls and, and attracted there and be guided. Uh, there was not a coincidence, or probably a coincidence, that at the same time, exactly the same time, the same story or similar story was published by Evan Polestanian and Anna Usman, where they use boundaries to steer active Janus particles, okay? So what is this story about? So you have the, that was something very intriguing here that uh, the, the Janus particles you see in the videos are like this, right? You see the two faces, but actually they should not be like this because the, the platinum is heavy, is 20 times higher uh, in density than the silica. So they should be bottom heavy. They should sediment like this. So, and, and we never see this in the video, right? Videos always seen like this, but uh, these are very, these are inactive. So when there is no peroxide, the particles look like that. So as I said, bottom heavy, but then as soon as they are in contact with the peroxide, they rotate. And, and this is something we observe experimentally. So we saw here that not all the particles are distributed very nicely around. 90 degrees, so they just rotate. And this is because of the chemical reaction, right? The, the products are rotating, slightly rotating the particles uh, once they are confined near, near a bottom wall. And that was also simulated by this phase diagram by, by Miko and, and company, right? So similar, this, this stable orientation was close to, to 90 degrees. So that started to make sense. And after that, of course, you see this interesting, this is the main reason why you see this interesting uh, motion parallel to the bottom wall because of this, this interaction and this product uh, with, the, with the bottom wall. So the next question is like, what happens if we add a sidewall, right? So we have here, then we have a, this particle is moving, then we add a sidewall. Can we use this very small, very tiny actually, a particle like this is uh, five, two or five micrometers, uh, but the sidewall is about hundreds of nanometers. So it's very, very tiny. It's not a, like a huge wall where, of course, this will bump, but it's just a very shallow. And, and that was the, the simulation made by, by Miko, how the particle is approaching the side wall, and then how the product is actually uh, accumulated here, high concentration. And they also observe uh, near 90 degrees, but with some deviation, uh, a slight orientation for the second wall. And here you see the, the side. Uh, I mean, the SEM image of the particle near the, the side wall. Let's look at the video. So this is what is happening. The particle is approaching, is reaching the wall, and then it rotates, it reorients about probably 10 degrees there, and it keeps aligning. 
So why we want to do this? This could be a way of controlling the direction of particles without any external, uh, external field. So many people have used, including ourselves, uh, magnetic fields like light and temperature to guide the particles. But in here, you could make microfabricated structures to guide the particle. Okay, so that was the the main main um, main discovery here. And and well, by the way, this is aerodynamic, but also as I said, this is a phoretic interaction happening there. So if you had a flat wall, the particle comes, is then like interacts, rotates, and move forward. Okay, but if if that was only gonna be hydrodynamics, right? The, the, the expected behavior will be that the particle will be approaching, and then in this convex wall, then they will just leave away, right? But since we have also the phoretic interaction I just mentioned, that was uh, based on the, the simulation and the observation we had, what happens is the following. So a particle approach here, so we have a spherical like pillar, and the particle keep rotating and rotating for over over very long times, right? So this we made post of different sizes from 50, 40, and 60 micrometers in diameter. And all the particles will approach and keep rotating, as you can see here. Well, these are bumping with each other, but they still keep interacting there. So the retention time is depending uh, on the chemical activity. So that tells us also about this phoretic interaction and not only hydrodynamics. Okay, so what else did we do with uh, this, this concept? I think this was actually done in parallel. So we use this interaction between surface passive object and, and active particles in collaboration with Roberto Di Leonardo from Rome. Um, because they had these micro gears that they were uh, activating by light. So they absorb light and they generate this grain in the round. But then we say, okay, why not to use our particles? So we had these uh, passive gears we put in onto the solution. Then the active Janus particles will come, will interact and get stuck here. Actually, we designed this angle in a way that the particle can get stuck there, as you can see in this uh, interesting media, right? So get gets anchored and keeps pushing the gear and rotate it. So we made some, I mean, this is a particle approaching, right? Is interacting here. G given this interaction, this, this alignment, it will rotate, right? It will just come here any direction, it will rotate and then push the gear forward. Okay, and we also studied how many particles are perfectly, uh, are the optimal for the propulsion. So one will expect, okay, but you have the gear complete, that might be the fastest one, but it's uh, actually not to our surprise. Maybe there's some counterbalance on the forces happening from one part to the other. We haven't investigated any farther. So if anyone is interested on, on this, we'll would be happy to, to continue. And uh, so it happened that this asymmetry actually is, is the most optimal, right? So then this gives us to, to the idea of using asymmetric particles, asymmetrically organized on passive particles to be, to, to push them uh, around. Okay, so le let's go back to the guiding, okay, on, this, on these walls on the side. So we talk about putting one wall, but what, I mean, we are expert also in microfabrication. So what if we make something more complex? Why not to use this ratchet structure to keep particles rotating and move them in the direction we want? Okay, so this is another work we uh, recently, we also published, this was in SCL Nano from, from JDIP. Um, so this is the design. So the idea is to move particles in one direction or the other. And um, before getting there, we made different prototypes. So prototype one, we thought, uh, okay, we can just guide them. Uh, with more round shapes or ellipsoid. Here, what you are seeing is the color code is on red. This would be counterclockwise and blue would be clockwise motion. So these are the tracking of the trajectories. So you see for this type of particle, it's totally random particles will go one way or the other. We went all the way to the other extreme, similar to the, the gears I show you just now. So we make very sharp edges but particles got stuck, so there was no motion. And then we went to a, a system in between, 
and we started to see some alignment in, in some some direction alignment in some part uh, the part that was moving like uh, clockwise the other one uh, anti clockwise but the final prototype is the following here we made a purely ratchet structure and we could control almost perfectly you see blue and red here depends on the the orientation of this of this uh, ratchet how the particles will move okay so here you can see a track trigger and here a zoom zoom of the of the direction of these particles. Let me put you some video so you have it more clear what's going on here. So these are like uh, hundreds of nanometers in height, micro fabricated uh, chip with the ratchet structure. The particles will sediment, will get into the well. And as you can see, probably on this, now we have many of them, they are moving in the direction we want. So we don't have to do anything. They move in the direction of the ratchet. So you can see some of them are, of course, colliding, and some of them are at some point moving in their own direction, like this one, right? But now they will just detach, and all of them, at some point, you see, it will go in that direction. Okay. So why is this happening? Thanks to this structure, we give you some some detail here. Once the particle is released from the first part, it will approach the site. Based on the first story I told you about in nature come, like the particle will interact with the wall, it will rotate. If it rotates towards the direction we want, it's fine, it will go away. But if it rotates in the wrong direction, it will just be expelled by this ratchet and get here with an angle, and then eventually it will go forward. So we've seen also the angle of this deviation angle is very important, maximum around 10 to 20 degrees, but then eventually they will go in the direction we want. So we can also have something which is in a line, like a chip, because we could eventually do this for sensing. Sometimes in sensing is a problem of sampling that you need to pre-concentrate. So imagine that you can have these micromotors labeled with some specific biomarker, and then you can have many of them in your sample, attach this, um, this marker, and then bring them here collectively, and then accumulate and uh, accelerate or, or increase the signal concentration, as you can see on this tracking after a few minutes. OK, so this is uh, one of the stories we have now. As I was saying, like uh, another paper, which is more complex, uh, mimicking topological insulators that probably we can discuss more, more in private. Uh, it's not published. It's under review right now. But we're going farther and farther into increasing the complexity of this system. So there's a lot on the collective motion here. And we always have in every single paper theory and, and simulation. So I would be very happy to discuss any further idea on, on this direction. So the next step, like JDBO is doing, is, is again, like now we are moving the flow. But what if, so the fact that the particles move induce a fluid flow motion, right? But what if we induce the flow to move? Uh, saying in another way, like if we impose an external shear flow. So this is, um, I mean, these bacteria and, and sperm, they also suffer all these flows. So they also align and they have um, rheotaxis or anti rheotaxis So we want to, to understand whether our particles have any kind of phenomena, any kind of deviation from the straight motion uh, uh, behavior once we apply uh, a flow. So this uh, we published uh, a couple of years in science advances. And um, here we'll start with this system, okay? So here you are seeing from left to right, we will impose a flow. And then we're gonna flash, we're gonna flow the particles together with it. But first I'm gonna show you a video of passive particles. There is no peroxide reaction here. These are Janus particles. And you will see what we observe. There's no flow, now we impose the flow. Now these particles are rotating, right? So this is what we expected. So that's a, the typical thing. So here we can uh, control the, the flow, then rotation time versus the velocity or velocity versus rotation time. So you will see um, the faster, of course, then the lower will be the rotation. And this is the behavior of the particle. OK, so these are by, by will. Um, now we bring activity to the system. OK, so I mean, the simulation says the particle will stay straight. Now, once we brought activity to a system, and these are, again, near the bottom surface. So the, the interaction with the surface is very, very relevant, very important in this case. 
So this is what happens to the particles. So here in this video, you'll see very fast. I will play a few times while I'm talking. Just look at the, the phenomena. If you track the particles, you will see this one going up or going down. So, and then based on the, also the simulation will tell us that there is a deviation and this is what we call cross stream migration, right? So if this is the flow, the, this is stream, the particles will go cross stream. So imagine in the future, I mean, this, when, when I'm always thinking about medicine, right? This will be, ama this will be amazing because you could have flies or particles there like in, in your capillaries and based on the flow and interacting with the walls, they will go to the side wall, which is where you have to interact, right? But, but in any case, NACA matter is already interesting because we give some more insight here. There's interaction with the wall, there's the flow, and the particle kept going across a string, right? This is what we call a cross stream migration. Good. Um, so, and then you can also uh, study the dependence of, of this angle on the flow velocity. So the faster the faster the flow, the faster uh, the the sharper it will be this this angle and so on. I mean there's there's a lot of uh, study here here behind. So okay, I think I want to to jump now to the second system. As I said, like there are a couple of things. We have another work as well, uh, studying some collectivity that we can discuss later. How we we generate uh, collective migration of motion, but this is this is not published. This is still in press. Uh, because of that, I want to to show you now our second system, which is part of our current activities. So until now, I told you about platinum-based particles, right? So platinum peroxide. It is a very neat and nice system, very efficient for active matter. But if we want on something in bio. By application, there's a limitation about the toxicity because of the free radicals as well, because of the oxygen you generate, the bubbles, and so on. But over the last years, I, I, I thought together with some of the people, I'll tell you the background now, on using different systems using enzymes. Okay, So that will allow us to have a nanorobot that we, or nanomotor that could go and do something in precision medicine, for example, mimicking what uh, Asimov was saying like in the, in the 60s. So why we want to do that? Uh, nanoparticles have been used in, in drug delivery system, but there's a meta metadata uh, work published in 2016, which says that despite all these advances, only 0.7% of the nanoparticles reach to the to the target to the tumor. So we we thought, well, we have the solution, right? We have something that is self-propelled. I mean, of course, there are many barriers, many problems to face um, before getting there. But if you have something that is self-propelled, might increase the chances to get to the tumor. And if you have something chemical, chemically active that will interact with the extracellular matrix and with this complex environment, that will be uh, much better, and hopefully, to increase this. So I remember when I was uh, in Japan, I was uh, I saw this paper from Feringa, uh, where they have multiple carbon nanotubes. Actually, I was working with nanotubes for biosensing in the past. So that, that's why all, everything was connecting here in my, my pile of papers. So what they did is they anchor glucose oxygen and catalase. So glucose oxygen will take the glucose, generate peroxide locally, and catalase will make the same reaction as platinum, uh, which is taking peroxide generated oxygen. So if you see this video, right? So basically here, what they say that this is a micromotor, which is moving based on this bubble, and all this is almost dust. Uh, leftovers from, from passive and non-active nanotubes. But there were some tricks here. So they had to put oxygen to generate oxygen. So as soon as they stop parking the oxygen, so the reaction will stop. So this is, this is a very complex cascade reaction that we and many groups have tried and couldn't reproduce uh, so efficiently. So what I, I tried to do then when I was, I, I moved for a short term to, to Dresden, is to have the same platinum-based microjets that I showed you in the beginning. And instead of putting platinum, remove it and put a gold layer where I will functionalize with self-assembly monolayers and then put catalyst. And as you see here, these are very old videos, actually like a microtube, which is propelled by this enzymatic reaction. We didn't want to go by very fast, but if you compare, right, it's more efficient than the platinum. So that gave me some ideas that, okay, I want to build my career, at least my, uh, next years on, on using enzymes 
for propulsion because this is possible, okay? However, these tubes were very large. And yeah, since we had to work on these tubes, then there was no way uh, to continue in this story. And only when I moved to Max Planck together with my first postdoc there, Shin Ma, so we combined ideas. So he was expert on mesoporosilica nanoparticles. So I wanted to do the enzyme catalysis, expert in micromotor. So we developed the one of the first uh, biocompatible nanomotors. So which are the components of these micro nanorobots and how do they look like? So I already told you about these spherical and tubular particles, right? And if we want to do something similar to a biological swimmer, we have to mimic, again, so the chassis structure, the outer structure. So the first component will be a chassis. So if you see these pictures and you see this is the biological, right? If you see underneath, these are SEM images from our microparticles, our micro robots. So the spherical particles of a couple of microns tubular, uh, again, of hundreds of nanometers. And also we can make virus-like structures of 100 nanometers. So this is our chassis. And by the way, this is a, a bio, so how it's called this? It's, some of these are FDA approved, so it's, it's mesoporosilica, and, and is a generally recognized as safe material, okay? So this is good starting point. Second component, you need enzymes. So you need something that will, you need the motor. So why enzymes is very compatible, versatile, and we will not only rely on the peroxide reaction. So we have 1300 enzymes in cells. We have 75,000 in our body. So you could think of any substrate that will be catalyzed by any uh, enzyme in principle should be good for moving, moving a particle. I'll tell you been more tricks in a while. Okay, enzymes. So this is a bit of state of the art. Enzyme has been have been also shown to chemotax using like single enzymes only, where you have four different enzymes. This was work from a Usman, where the product of A is a subset of the B, the product of B is a subset of C, and then they move collectively from one place to another. Then also Bataglia and, and Volpe have showed the chemotaxis of polymerase nanomotors using this glucose oxidase reaction. And, and I, I like also this work a lot because it's a magnetic propel, propeller from Fisher, but they have urease enzyme on the, on the head. So only when the enzyme reaction is happening, taking place, this propeller can move in viscous media like similar to a lycobacter pylori. So again, not only here, what I'm telling you about is that it's not only the propulsion, but also the chemical interaction right, with the media, but also the communication among enzymes, which is very, very interesting. And also like Henry has published this paper about collective dynamics. So pattern formation can, can occur using enzyme reactions. So what have we done? So we took these enzymes, we coupled to mesoporosilica, in different, different structures, nanoparticles, microparticles, and nanotubes. So here, all what you're seeing is any of these structures with urease, react, urease enzyme. And here, what I want to, you to pay attention is the different dynamics, right? So nanoparticles are basically uh, enhanced Brownian particle. So this is a typical Brownian like uh, motion so microparticles will show more directional ballistic motion. And also in this, in this case, we have seen a very tiny one. Now we are increasing. So while as we increase the size of this nanojet or this nanotube, so it's becoming more directional. And you will see uh, maybe, maybe it's here cut, but we had at the end, yeah, 18 microns, you see all the way you can keep straight. Okay. So I'm not gonna go through all, all these points, but um, over the last year, we tried to answer some fundamental aspects or fundamental questions like, okay, so which are the best enzymes for propulsion? How many enzymes we need for this propulsion? How are they distributed on the particles? What determines the dynamics? So how is this interacting with the media? And then once we understand this, we can also work on biomedical application, okay? But First, I will jump to that. So there have been many, many enzymes, not, not too many, but a few of them have been used in the literature. So we review this in, in accounts 
chemical research a couple of years ago. So from the left side, you will see this arrow shows the KCAT. So uh, turnover rate as well, uh, catalytic turnover from uh, smaller to higher to, to fast. So catalyst will be faster, UDAs, acidic cholesterol, and, and all these reactions. So you've seen that from catalyst and UDAs, there's a lot of work compared with the other, which are uh, rather slow. So what we, we did when we we're at the maximum is to take these mesoporosilic and make them janus. And we said, maybe we don't need so many, maybe we don't need two enzymes like Feringa was showing, right? If the reaction is actually happening because you have a diffuse sulfuretic motion where you take a substrate, you decompose into different B, B and C products with different diffusion coefficients. So maybe we can have a really emotion. So we took particle, we anchored catalase, we took another one, anchored urease, another one with glucoloxase. And then we plot the mean square displacement, but also the diffusion coefficient, which checked by uh, optical tracking, by also by dynamic like scattering. And we saw that uh, upon an increase of peroxide concentration with this substrate, there's increase of diffusion. Also happens the same for UDAs, and the same happens, or similar happens to glucose oxidase. But of course, this, this glucose here, it was reduced because of auto inhibiting reaction, probably all because of the viscosity of the media as well when you add so much glucose. But that was the first proof of, of principle. We did this, by the way, this was with 300 nanometers particles. We did the same for microparticles, and that is very recent from uh, last year, two years ago, where we see many enzymes, but no one took one single particle, same particle, and studied systematically how enzymes are affected, right? So we took very uh, specifically for enzymes with different KCAT, aldolase, which is very slow, glucose oxidase, because it's interesting uh, for glucose decomposition, but uh, it's rather slow. Acetylcholinesterase is good because um, acetylcholine is uh, a signaling for uh, metastasis and cancer. So we tried, okay, let's, let's see if that works. And urease, which is very high. So we saw, I mean, I'm going to summarize the, the whole paper with this inhibitor and this theory, their simulation here on one simple single plot, okay? Which tells us that the faster the enzyme, in principle, the faster the speed of this motion. Okay, and there are many other things like, like the conformation of these enzymes, the flapping, uh, the motion, the flexibility around the flap or the active side and so forth. But just to keep it simple, Yuri is what happened to be the best for us. So all what you are going to see from now on is about Yuri's reaction. Okay. So the second part was that everyone in the community was talking about Janus. Everyone had a physically Janus structure, either uh, one side or inside outside, right? Here inside they have the catalyst or right and left two phases for uh, enhanced diffusion and ballistic. But they were in 2015. There was oh, uh, or yeah, I don't know. There was, there was a paper from uh, a Usman cell where it says, okay, we took a particle and then we fully coated it with enzymes, and we thought, well, this cannot happen, right? So you do need some sort of asymmetry. But if that will be the case, you could take the particles, dip into a, an enzyme solution, leave it to react, and then you don't need anything else. So um, that will simplify the method, reduce the cost and increase the yield. So we did it like this, we took particles, we just uh, functionalized with UDAs. In this case, we use glutral layer cross-linking and then bingo, we had motion. Okay, maybe this is not surprising for you because you have seen already today uh, a few videos of this, these particles moving, but be aware that this is not a Janus particle. Okay, so this is moving, uh, yeah, we have the silica, we just put into enzyme, literal layer cross-linking, put into urea solution and it moves compared here with the control. So we wanted to know why is this happening? So what we did is to use super resolution microscopy. Let's say you label your enzyme. So we wanted to, to know like how are they distributed? So this is a confocal image with the red image comes from the labeling of the enzyme. So in principle, this is not enough to tell you the asymmetry but if you use a storm microscopy, which is this blinking that you are seeing here, you reconstruct the whole structure um, by super resolution, you see these nice rings. Okay, so these rings will tell you that if you see there are some gaps here. So it tells you that every single particle is asymmetric. So this molecular asymmetry is enough for 
motion of the particle, which is, uh, I think this is very beautiful also image. Like here you have a 3D stack of every single point is an enzyme. But when we saw this 3D, we said maybe it's not enough. So what we did is to have some Python cone here to, to see the density distribution. So the higher the density, the packing of these enzymes, it will be the blue color. So in every single particle, there's a priori a patchy like structure. So these patches um, lead to the to this asymmetric proportion of the particle. Okay, so we try to localize, and this is what the surprising. I have been for a couple of years trying to understand why this is happening. And, and it's difficult, right? So because we have more molecules, but it doesn't correlate with the speed. So there's a, like a two-phase transition here. For a while, there was no motion. And then suddenly, when you reach a number of enzymes, then it jumps to high motion, and then it saturates. So let me, let me skip this one, just to tell you that, I mean, well, this basically, even if you put a lot of enzymes, this is a high concentration of enzymes, still you have asymmetry. And this is a very a small, uh, concentration of enzymes, asymmetry, but no motion. We're doing this at the nanoscale now. I will skip that one because in the last uh, three, four minutes, I want to, to jump to the last part. So now we have the urea particle, um, which moves with urea is the particle that moves with urea is fully biocompatible. We don't have any metal inside because it's molecularly asymmetric. And we patent this concept. We have the silica with UDS and we can anchor many things, nanoparticles, enzymes, linker for imaging, teranostics, and drug loading. So, and this is all from Anna and, and Tania. So this is how we have gone from sensing to drug delivery. And now I just want to tell you the final application. So where do we have urea? Urea is in our urine, is the major components, and then this is in the bladder. So bladder cancer is one of the most common. I didn't know about this, but the problem here is the diagnostic and the treatment is very bad. So the recurrence is very high and that leads to, the, to be the most expensive cancer to treat. So we thought, why not to try to get there and to use it? So we replicate an, uh, a tumor in our lab. This is an spheroid. So let me go on. this is to show that they move in urine. So these are all these spheroids, hundreds of cells uh, here together in the bump. Right, and this is the, the immunostaining for the, the receptor of the membrane. And then, if we functionalize these nanobots with antibody, which is all targeting and also therapeutic, we could see a couple of things. First, that if there's no urea, there's no fuel, there are no nano robot nanoparticles inside. The red dots are nanoparticles that only get into the spheroid when you add urea. And to simplify this plot, because we have many controls, I can tell you here that. If we add fuel, there's an increase of 14 times, but also 43% reduction of the tumor progression. So it is very nice. You can see here how the proliferation of the tumor reduces. But still, we need to see them inside. I'm, I'm gonna jump to this one. Just to tell you, there are only a couple of papers on this work in vivo. And that is what we just published yesterday. And this is the, the prime prime uh, message today because it has been I'm very happy in, in the media and you can see several highlights. We've seen the swarming in vivo using this enzymatic uh, nanomotors. To see that, because you use PET-CT with our collaborator from Fibio Maune, we have to radio, radio label them. So we put two labels like a fluorine, but also iodine. I can tell you we can bind the fluorine directly on the enzymes. And this is much nicer because then we don't need any metallic particle. And here you can see a few videos on different replicates. Here, what we are adding is a, on the optical microscope, a drop of these nanoparticles. If there's no urea, you see they just sediment get stuck to the glass. But once you add urea, right, they start to move collectively. They generate some, uh, and now you can see they generate this particle uh, image velocimetry. They can generate some flows around. Um, becoming like very active collectively. So it's not only the particle, but the interesting here was how can we move the liquid which is around? And you will see why it is important. Okay, these are different cases. And uh, this is the heat map to show you the, the presence on the, the time residence. So this is very static and this is very dynamic with all these lines of flows happening here, this, this light blue. And again, 
the fluid flow generated. Okay, so very vigorous uh, reaction even from nano nanoparticle um, nanoparticle based motors. Okay, so we now what about the imaging? So that was optically. Now we use the radio labeling, and first we made microfluidic devices to see. Here you have the control on the left, the moving with urea. This is the, the swarm of nanorobots moving in microfluidics. So we were challenging the nanomotors to move through more complex uh, uh, parts. Okay, and these are some of, of the videos here. We put into a mice and then we could see and follow the distribution. And we finally, finally conclude that the fluorine was the best for a more stable uh, radio label and the mice were alive, which is pretty good for us. And the last slide here is how we see them inside the bladder. So this is a mice bladder. Okay, the red part is the swarm, swarm of nanomotors and the green is the whole volume of the bladder. So you have nanomotors moving in urea. The final conclusion is also with this 3D, the CT reconstruction in 3D here, is how they can reach the whole volume of the, of the bladder, which is extremely interesting to disperse the drug, to get the drug and the nanorobots uh, to the wall where the, the bladder will be. So yeah, these are, we also have different controls with proteins, which can mimic the presence of, of a, well, the, the combination of nanoparticles and motors, but also all the controls without, without fuel. Okay, so the, to quantify here, we generate one phase, they all merge into one whole volume, but there are two phases always when there's water or therefore when there is, there is any, any other control of forms to what two phases. So just to conclude, I don't want to extend too much in the nano, nanoparticle part for medicine, we want to achieve a higher efficiency. So hopefully move from the 0.7% probably to the 20% uh, on, on drug delivery to reach the tumor. So in, in general, so I hope I could convince you that we can make micro nanobots, which are self-powered, right? And in our case, we want to make them biocompatible. We want also to understand some fundamental aspects, like how to align them, how to guide them, how they collectively cooperate. We want to control the motion by probably with this architecture, with the wall, with the surface, or with any external field, sensing actuator and in vivo imaging. So we are not only confined to the mesoporosilica, just to show you that in the last uh, couple of months, we use MOF, Metallic Organic Framework, collaboration with Danima Spot Group, and also with them with liposomes. And we are opening to, to new materials, more fluidic materials that will be also very interesting to mimic uh, protocells or artificial cells from the organic point of view. So if any of you have any, any other idea of, of new materials, I would be very happy to, to collaborate with. So thank you to, to my guys. My guys are very, very active group, very motivated, and then the funding and many of the collaborators in this particular topic. And thank to you for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting presentation, rich in, in, in effect. So now we have a 10 minutes for discussions. If someone wants to ask questions, please go ahead. Okay, so maybe I can start myself with one question. So in those particles fully covered by enzymes, that idea of sand, as you said, those enzymes, when they are attached to the surface, they move or they are uh, along the surface, can they assemble, interact, or they are static? That is, that, that is thank you, Miko. This is very, very good question. Actually, I, can you believe that, that a few years ago, uh, Yusman Sen asked me the same question at the MRS, I think it was 2018. And I thought, what, why he's asking me this? So, I mean, we are cross-linking the enzymes, to the particles, so it's fully stuck. But then we start to think, well, that would be very nice because if enzymes will move, right, in a fluidic membrane, that will mimic a cell, a cell polarization. That would be really uh, uh, cool. And, and then at the same time, uh, my... My postdoc, who already left, uh, also is doing fluid dynamics. He we just actually published a paper on that. So he wanted to move to do the theory on that whether it will happen this polarization. So we have a, a physical review uh, 
fluids, physical fluids on, on that. And we have for a while submitted a paper, which I think is gonna be very, very nice in collaboration with other groups. So if you have a fluid membrane, okay, just to tell you the answer, if you have a fluid membrane where you can functionalize enzymes there, enzymes do move. And that leads to out of the equilibrium system, that leads to motion. In that paper that we haven't published yet, uh, we also have the control fixing the enzymes the same way we did with the silica. So if you fix the enzymes, the motion is more efficient. But if you don't fix it, probably it's more interesting, right? Because of the lifelike systems, like mimicking this. So it, it can happen. We do have the system, not published, so wait for it a little bit. <laughs> but it's a very good question. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. OK, Samo. Margarita, please. Oh, thank you. It was a very nice talk. Uh, this is a, a, a question, but in, in the in vivo experiments, of course, you have the tumor model in, in vitro. But when you do the in vivo um, experiments, where do you put your uh, nano robots? I mean, do you inject them? Do you put them in pills? Do you actually go to the bladder? I mean, I didn't understand that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Maria. I, I went very quick there. Uh, so actually what we are doing is, uh, let, me, let me share it again, Miko, probably, or if you want. So what we are doing is to inject it directly to uh, the- In the bladder. The so this okay. is intravestical. So this is exactly the same, you see? No, 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 no. yeah, I, I thought you might be doing that, but I was just uh, trying to, to understand, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is a typical immuno chemotherapy is done now in the clinic, so intravesical uh -huh. injection. And so then what we do is we, we empty the bladder from the mice, we inject the nanomotors, the, the mice start to generate but, urine inside, right? Start to generate urine there, and then in reaction with the, with the, with the nanomotor, they start to, to move collectively, yeah, and move inside. Very nice, yeah. I mean, it would be much more difficult if you just uh, did it in some other way, because then- No, it... yeah, actually, this is, I mean, in this video, what we did is actually like uh, intravenous injection to see the stability of the isotope, to see whether that will be extremely damaging the, the mice. But indeed here, it, it reached very, if you see here in the bladder, very little concentration of nanomotors arrive. So there are so many barriers that that's not possible. But, but then in uh, part yeah, of it, yeah, yeah. Right? In that picture, you just need the intravenous here and, and it doesn't get to the bladder. Exactly. But okay. then if you inject directly to the blood, that's the idea yeah, because sure. they, how they do. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. So more questions? Let me. Okay, so maybe I can ask a, a second question myself. So in that, in that collective swarming behavior, so as I understand, you want to understand formation of uh, self-assembled dynamic structures and then how to control them and how they move and mix fluid. Oh. Yeah, this, this last one, right, this, this swarming, uh, this is just the starting point. Now, I would like to know how are the flows generated how can we control, can we make some pattern dynamics? Can we guide them collectively to a one point? So why do they move like this? Is there any, any leadership, right? Like in, in birds or in fish, uh, how do they react to chemical gradients? Because then we are doing many things on, kind, you, you know, right? Since I was in Dresden in 2013, I was stubborn on this chemotaxis, which is so complicated to replicate, but now in vivo, maybe or in vitro with cells, that's, that's part of my ERC. So if we want to, to see if the signal generated from cells can induce some pattern, some flow dynamics, some collective dynamics of these, these nanomotors. And so generating this chemical gradient is gonna help them move in one direction or not. And, and then also like there are many studies, I guess, right? From the physics, like how this pattern formation are generated, again, how interacting with the walls, how do, one of the things I want to do is how do they talk to each other? Can we do this, these cascade reactions, right? Uh, among different enzymes. So one troop of enzymes will send a signal to another troop of, of enzyme nanoparticles and they move collectively. So there are many things open there. So that's, I think this is very good timing that we, we talk here, right? From different disciplines 
So we can think about any any future idea together. Yeah? Okay. As there more questions from audience, or comments or suggestions. <laughs> okay. So there is no. Then uh, we can thank Samuel again, and we will uh, resume next week again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Samuel. Pa Paolo, please don't disconnect connection. Okay. Recording stops now. Okay, you can